Now, once you've got your nest settled, I want you to sit up and look at me just for a moment before I give you my scripture and we begin tonight. I have so many things that I want to say to you over the next few hours, but I'm going to begin with the most simple thing tonight. As a matter of fact, I'm going to begin with the one story that Jesus told that he said, if you don't get this, you don't get anything else. Of all the things that Jesus ever taught, and he taught a lot, can you imagine sitting, listening to Jesus teach and preach? But there was one story that Jesus gave. It was so important that it's given repeatedly in the gospel records. And it's the one story that when people ask him, what does that story mean? Jesus said, don't you get it? If you don't understand this, how on earth do you think you're going to understand anything else I'm going to say to you? And I'm going to tell you that if you don't listen to what I say to you tonight, and you don't get what I'm going to show you from the Word of God, then you're going to miss everything else God wants to say to you in this Youth Congress. Not because I'm saying it, because this is what Jesus said, and it's a foundation that everything else builds on. Now, with that in mind, I want you to open your Bible with me to the second book in the New Testament, the Gospel according to Mark. And I want you to find Mark chapter number 4. This is my favorite Gospel record. Somebody said their favorite was whichever one they were reading at the time, and I understand that because it's all the Word of God. It's wonderful. Uh, but I love the gospel according to Mark. And I'm curious if you have a favorite gospel record. How many of you would say Matthew is your favorite? Would you raise your hand? Any fans of Matthew? I see three lone hands. God bless you, Matthew fans. How many of you love Mark like me? Would you raise your hand, please? Anybody? Nobody? One other person? I hope when I'm done tonight, some of the rest of you are like Mark. How many of you love Luke, Dr. Luke? That's interesting. How many of you love John? That's a favorite of most people. How many of you never read the Bible, have no idea? Would you raise your hand, please? Ah, you'll tell on yourself now, right? I love Mark. Mark was written to a mind that loves action. If you like action and you like adventure, oh, well, that's the way Mark wrote. He wrote to the Roman mind. As a matter of fact, 14 out of the 16 chapters start with the word and or straightway. It's like this drama that once it starts, it just keeps moving. It's, a, it's an amazing story. There was a young man years ago that went off to study in a major university, and while he was there, some college professors tried to destroy his faith. They told him there was no God and lots of other things. And uh, he said the one thing that helped him keep his faith during that season of his life is that every night when he got home, he'd get by himself and he'd read through the entire gospel according to Mark every night. And uh, some of you that are struggling, if you want one gospel record to read all the way through at one sitting, Mark would be a great one to do that with because it's the shortest of them. It's only 16 chapters long and it just flows. And when you come to Mark chapter number four, it's an amazing setting because Jesus is standing looking at an enormous crowd. Now, let me just stop and say, this is a great crowd tonight. And I'm thrilled you're here, and I hope you'll be here for every session, and I'm excited about it. Uh, but the crowd Jesus was looking at was so big, there wasn't even room hardly for him to stand where he was standing. They were pushing and pressing, trying to get close to him. So Jesus gets out in a boat, has the boat push out away from the shore a little bit. He sits down on the bow of the ship, and he uses like a, a natural projector with the water uh, to use his voice so that everyone could hear him. And on the shore, this huge crowd of people is gathered, and they're all listening with real attention because Jesus is speaking. Now, look, the Bible says never man spake like this man. Every word that came out of his mouth, the Bible says, was gracious words. Look, every word that came out of his mouth was on purpose. And he opens his mouth, sitting in that boat, and this is what they heard. Mark chapter 4, verse number 3. Hearken. Behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth. Of earth but when the Sun was up it was scorched and because it had no root it withered away and some fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it and it yielded no fruit and other fell on good ground 
and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some 30, some 60, some 100. And he said unto them, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. How many of you have ears? Would you raise your hand, please? Oh, wait a minute. Actually, the ears he's talking about here are not physical ears. It's spiritual hearing. Did you know it's possible that you could hear me speak but not hear God speak to you? Sure it is. I was in a place speaking not long ago, and they had a deaf section, and someone was signing to our deaf friends, and they did not have physical hearing, but spiritually they were, they were in the zone. They were in tune. They knew exactly what was being said. Why? Because the great language is not the language you hear with your body. It's the language you hear with your soul. And the great voice that you hear is not the voice of a preacher. The great voice that you hear is the voice of the Holy Spirit of God speaking to you. And let's just get this one out of the way right up front. If the only thing that happens in the next 48 hours is I preach several sermons and give several lessons and you take really good notes and hear it all, that's all that happens, then I've wasted my breath and you've wasted your time. Because you don't need to hear me. I don't need to hear me. I get sick of hearing myself, to be honest with you. We all need to hear from God. And so Jesus says, do you have ears? Excuse me, do you have ears to hear? And they're sitting there thinking, well, of course we got ears. We're listening to you right now. Well, that wasn't the point. Jesus was saying, I got a message I'm trying to get through to you. Are you in tune enough to receive it? Do you hear the music in here right now? Shh. Do you hear the music? Somebody said, preacher, you're losing your mind. There's no music in Oh, yes, there is. As a matter of fact, there's lots of music in this room at this moment. It's filling, it's filling this room everywhere. So I said, preacher, you're hearing things. The preacher's lost his mind. Oh, no. Now, give me a radio. Let me sit it on this platform and start tuning the dial. And immediately somebody will say, oh, I know that station. And somebody else will say, I know that voice. And somebody else will say, oh, I know that song. But listen to me now. That music was here all along. You just had to get in tune enough to receive it. And I want to say to you, there's a God in heaven who's at work in this world and speaking in this generation and he's looking for some young people who get in tune enough with him and in tune enough with heaven to receive what it is he's trying to say. So I ask you again, do you have ears to hear? There's several interesting parts of this story. First, there's a sower in this story. Now, we don't all understand this unless you've grown up on a farm I grew up on a farm in the mountains of West Virginia, and uh, my grandpa was a farmer, and I remember when he'd go out and till up the ground, get things ready, and it was work. Man, it was work. And when he went out, there was always a certain plan about what he was going to sow and where he was going to sow and what he hoped the harvest would be. In Jesus' day, the sower would go out with huge bushels of seed, and he's casting it everywhere. The sower's doing his work. I want to tell you tonight, there's a sower in this room. Somebody said, oh, that's the preacher. Wrong answer. I'm not the sower. I just work for him. The sower in this room tonight is the same sower that was in Mark chapter 4. Listen to me, please. The sower is the Lord. Who is it trying to speak to you? Who is it trying to deposit truth into your heart? Who is it trying to get something in your life that will change the rest of your life? That's not just man, friend. That's God. One of the great mistakes people make is they think it's all about human relationships. Some of you think a youth pastor won't get off your case. Maybe that's true. Some of you think your parents won't leave you alone or your pastor really preaches hard or somebody made you come to this youth congress. But let's remove all the human beings from the equation for just a minute. Did it ever dawn on you that there's actually a God who's trying to work in you? Philippians chapter 2 verse 13 says, It is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. I'm sorry, it's not your mama, it's not your daddy, it's not your youth director, it's not your pastor, and it's not this evangelist. It is God that is trying to work in you. And the sower is Christ himself. Well, that's the sower. What's the seed? You're holding it in your lap right now. Can I borrow your Bible for just a moment, please? That's a nice Bible. Takes a lot of batteries to keep that one glowing, doesn't it? Very nice. Look, please, just a minute. You know what this is? Somebody said, that's a book. No, that's not just a book. Somebody said, well, that's, that's the Bible. Oh, yes, that's what we call it. But let me tell you in Jesus' language what this is. This is seed. 
As a matter of fact, Luke records the same story, and Luke is the one that says the seed is the word of God. And every time a preacher preaches the Bible, and every time somebody teaches you the truth, and every time you read the Scripture, God is trying to deposit seed into your heart and life. And let me just tell you, there is power in that seed. Do you understand that a whole forest is in one seed? Do you understand the power of one seed, what it has to produce and then reproduce again and again and again and again? Listen to me, please. One word from me is not going to change your life. Many words from me is not going to change your life. But one word from God that comes home to your heart, that could change your life forever. Why? Because the seed is the word of God. Matter of fact, back in the book of Isaiah, uh, I think it's chapter 55, there's an amazing verse we love to quote. It goes something like this. God says, my word shall not return unto me void. It shall accomplish the purpose whereto I sent it. That's a great verse. But I started reading and studying, and I found out there's a verse before it. Do you know what the verse before it says? The verse before it says that the word of God is like the rain that comes down from heaven and waters, guess what, the seed that's planted in the earth and brings forth fruit. And then he says, so is my word that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. It shall accomplish the purpose whereto I sent it. Same illustration. In other words, the seed is not just some sermon. It is literally the word of God that's been sent down from heaven. So we know who the sower is and we know what the seed is. And then there's spiritual fruit. That's what we're trying to get. And everybody, it's a little different. The Bible says some people produce 30, some 60, some 100. But the goal is spiritual fruit. Look me in the eye, please. The goal is not for you to have a good time this week. We think you'll have a good time, but that's a byproduct, not the goal. The goal is for you to be more like Jesus Christ. The goal is for you to discover why you're breathing, why God puts you on this earth, what God has for the rest of your life, and more important, where you're going to spend eternity. Spiritual fruit, that's what people are praying for. Over the last several weeks, there have been people fasting and praying for this meeting. Before I came into this meeting tonight, I prayed for you. Though I don't even know you, I prayed for you that God would do something out of the ordinary in this meeting and all of these meetings, and that out of this, much fruit would come. I'm looking at Christine sitting here, serving the Lord here in this place now, and I thought about the Youth Congress, how many years ago, a long time ago now, that she came and her brother as teenagers to this Youth Congress. And God spoke to them and stirred their hearts. I still remember that conversation with your family standing out in the hallway. And then they go off to Bible college and get their training. And now they're serving the Lord and impacting other people. Do you know what that is? That's spiritual fruit. Let me tell you what we're praying for tonight. We're praying for spiritual fruit. And not just fruit, a lot of fruit. And not just a lot of fruit, fruit that remains. That's what we're praying for. Matter of fact, in my own personal devotions this morning, I was in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I love this. 1 Corinthians 3 says, one man sows, another man waters, but God gives the increase. Now, your pastor, your youth pastor, they've been sowing a lot in you, and I get the privilege of watering some of that seed for the next couple of days. I'm going to tell you, if any good thing comes from your life, it's not going to be you and it's not going to be me. It's all going to be God working in our lives. But now we come to the point of the story. See, every story Jesus told had one main point. The sower is Jesus. The seed is the word. The spiritual fruit is what God wants to produce in your life, not what you can produce. But here's the crux of the story, the soils. What makes the difference? Jesus is always the same. He never changes. That book, that Bible, it's always the same. It's the eternal truth of God to every generation, forever settled in heaven. It never changes. Let me tell you what does change and vary from person to person. The soil. It's a funny thing, but in Scripture, we're often likened to dirt. Did you know that? Turn and look at your neighbor just a minute, would you please? Everybody, don't look at me. Turn and face your neighbor just a second. Gaze into their lovely eyes. Stare at them just a moment. Some of you sat next to the wrong person. I'm sorry about that. Do you know what you're looking at right now? You're looking at a certified ball of dirt. That's what you're looking at right now. You say, preacher, that's not very nice. Sorry. It's the truth. It may be a ball of dirt with beautiful hair. It may be a ball of dirt with no hair. It may be a ball of dirt with makeup on. I hope it's a girl if that's what you're looking at. It may be a ball of dirt with designer clothes. But any way you slice it, look please, where'd man come from? The Bible says that God made man of the dust of the ground. And 
breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. Ecclesiastes says someday that body is going back to the dust of the ground and the spirit is returning to God who gave it. So watch this, please. Your body is dust. But in Jesus' story, he's actually not talking about your body. He's going much deeper than that. He's going to the part of you that only you and God know about. See, I can see right now your body. I can see how you fixed yourself up and how you present yourself publicly. But I can't see the real you, but God sees the real you. And way down deep inside, God knows you. And what is this soil? The soil is the human heart. And the one thing that makes the difference on how much fruit comes is one thing. Look at me, please. Some of you think it's up to the preacher. It is not up to me. The one thing that makes the difference is your heart. I never cease to be amazed at this. Week after week, I'm in different meetings, and I can preach one message in a crowd filled with lots and lots of people, and on the same pew, one person can be broken over their sin. Just, whew, man, i got to get right with God. And on the very same pew can be a person sits with her arms crossed, just glaring and saying, I'm not interested. How's it possible? How's it possible that in a youth congress like this, one young man in the group can be hungry for God and the other one totally turned off by it? How's that possible? How is it possible that one young lady can pursue truth and another young lady can say, I'm going to pursue the world? I'm going to tell you how. Because, watch please, it's not about what's on the surface. It's about what's down deep in your heart. The preacher and I were talking about this earlier today, but I can't make you and the preacher can't make you. Nobody can make you. you got to want it for yourself. Nobody can... Nobody can force Jesus into your heart. You've got to open your heart up and let the Lord Jesus take his rightful place in your life. That's a decision you've got to make. Hey, a lot of decisions were made for you you didn't get to pick. Like, you didn't get to pick your name. Some of you hate your name. You didn't get to pick your name. You didn't get to pick what nose is on your face. Some of you said, no, if I'd picked, I'd have picked a different nose. I understand. Some of you didn't get to pick who your parents are. You didn't get to pick where you live. There are lots of things you didn't get to choose. But one thing you have to choose is you have to choose what kind of heart you're going to have toward God. And Jesus gives four. He gives four. I want you to mark two words in your Bible, if you will, please. When I stop, say the next two words. Verse number eight. And other fell on what? Let's try that one again. Verse eight. And other fell on what? Underline that in your Bible. Good ground. And in the margin, I want you to write this. Good ground for God. Let me tell you what I'm praying for tonight. I'm praying for good ground for God. I know the seed is good. It's the word of God. It's perfect. But what I'm praying for is for some good ground for God. I know if the seed gets in there and you receive it, the fruit will be good. But it's got to have good ground first. It's interesting, but they, these people didn't get it. You ever sit in church and listen to a preacher and think, I don't understand a word he's saying? I've been there. Frankly, sometimes I've preached things and thought, I don't understand a word I'm saying, you know? There are moments where you just kind of get dull in your mind. And they, these people are sitting around, they say, we don't understand this story. So Jesus says, look, this is very important. Look at verse number 13. He said to them, know you not this parable? How then will you know all parables? The sower soweth the word. And then he begins to describe these four types of soil. I'm going to represent them tonight by these four chairs. And I'm going to say to you, every person in this room, every person in this room is sitting in one of four chairs tonight. You're already in them. Now, when I finish speaking, you have to determine which one you want to be in. What I'm praying is some of you get up out of one chair and sit down in another chair. You say, physically? No, no, we're talking about your heart here. And let me warn you about something. When I finish in just a moment, I'm going to ask every person in this room to respond. Every teenager, every child, and every adult. He said, but I didn't come for that. Can't be neutral truth. Somebody said, but I'm not making a decision. Then you've already made your decision. I'm going to ask you to respond to Jesus' story just like he asked them to respond. So listen very carefully. And if you say, well, you're, you're judging me. Oh, no, no, I don't even know you. I'm not going to judge you tonight. You're going to judge yourself. 
See, because the truth has this tendency to reveal who you really are. Here's the first one. Look what the Bible says. You got your Bible open? Mark chapter 4, Jesus talking. Listen to the preacher. He says in verse 15, these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. What's a wayside? Look up here just a minute. Here's the first guy. The wayside basically was the walking path. It was like the side of the road. It's where people walked all the time. Look, you walk on ground long enough, nothing grows there. Because it just, it's worn out. It's trodden down. It's dirt. It's like their sidewalk. So watch, the sower comes out and throws some seed. Now the seed's good, and the sower's good, and he wants good fruit, but he throws the seed on the wayside. And what happens? Jesus says, look at it, verse number 15, when they've heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. So here's the first soil. Are you ready? First soil is the hard heart. They're just hard. I mean, they are not interested. By the way, I have no idea who I'm preaching to right now, but there's probably somebody like that in this room. For the record, this particular person, I believe, is a person that is not even saved. They're not a believer. The other gospel records tend to bear that out. They've heard the truth, but they've rejected it. And let me tell you something about a hard heart. Watch this, please. You know how it gets hard? Every time you say no, it gets harder. That's why I'm very concerned for some of you who sit in youth meetings like this and church meetings week after week after week. And you know what you ought to do, but you keep saying no. And for the record, tomorrow is another word for no. Later is just another way of saying no to the Holy Spirit of God. And I want you to know something. It is very dangerous to say no to God. Do you remember Pharaoh? Every time the man of God came and said, God said, let my people go. He said, no, no, no. And every time, read it for yourself in Exodus, the Bible says his heart got harder. He hardened his heart. One day, he said, all right. I'll, I'll, I'll let it all happen tomorrow. That was just another way of saying no. Hear me, please. You want a hard heart? Then you resist what the Holy Spirit of God is telling you to do. What is it God has spoken to you about and you've said no? Where is it you're stuck? When was the last time God dealt with you about something and you resisted the Lord and said, I'm not doing that? Watch, please. If you're not very careful, you're going to get a hard heart. Let me tell you, the devil loves that. He's like the birds, the fowls of the air that come grab the seed and carry it away. It never brings forth any fruit because it is hard. Here's the second one. Look at it, please. Second chair, second soil, second heart. Jesus says in verse number 16, and these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground. Somebody said, isn't that the same thing? Oh, no. No, not at all. Look at it. Who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. And have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. You know the problem with a stony heart? You can't see it on the surface. As a matter of fact, hold on to your seat. I think this heart is harder to spot than this heart. This one you can see is hard on the surface, rebellious, not interested. This one has rocks beneath the surface. My wife and I moved back to West Virginia with our children. We built a house at our old family farm, and we cleared a place for the house, and we cleared a place for a lawn, and I was so excited about it. And you know, when you're landscaping, you've got to get all the rocks out. The problem with where we live in West Virginia is that there's a lot of rock. As a matter of fact, uh, no, no sooner do you get the ones on the surface, and you get a good rain, and suddenly more of them keep popping up. And I learned it didn't matter how much grass seed I put down until I dealt with all the rocks that were beneath the surface. May I ask you a personal question? What's beneath the surface in your heart that hasn't been dealt with? You know what a stone is? A stone is a stubborn place. A stone is a hard thing that has not yet been broken up. That's why the Bible says in the book of Jeremiah, break up your fallow ground. It says it again in the book of Hosea. Listen to me now. God will put the right stuff in and God will bring the right stuff out. But you got to break up your own fallow ground to give God the opportunity to work in your life. In other words, you got to come to the place where you say, God, I want you to deal with those stubborn areas in me. I want you to deal with that that nobody can see. Let me tell you one of my great burdens in youth meetings 
I see, I see preachers come in and they preach sermons and young people get all emotionally charged up, stirred up, man, they're going to reach the world for Christ. Six weeks later, they're not even attending Sunday school. They're making commitments. They're standing around bonfires, throwing sticks in and giving testimonies, but nothing comes of it. And you know what somebody says? Even the devil whispers this. See, you didn't mean it. But I don't think that's it. The Bible says that the stony ground received the word. The problem was, look please, it received it on the surface, but there was something deep that it did not deal with. And the Bible says it begins to grow, and it even uses this phrase, for a time, for a while. Look please, some of you read the Bible for a while. You prayed for a time. You witnessed to your friend for a while. You were faithful in the youth group for a while. This time last year at the Alabama Youth Congress, you got all stirred up and made some commitment in an altar, and it lasted for a time. And if you're really, really serious about it, it lasted for some good time, but it's fizzled out now. Do you know why it's fizzled out now? Because there's something in your heart that has not yet been fully yielded to the lordship of Jesus Christ. And so I want to ask you, what's the thing beneath the surface you've got to deal with? You've got the hard heart, you've got the stony heart, and then there's a third one. Look what Jesus says. Look at it, please. Verse number 18, and these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. So now you've got thorny ground. I hate thorns. They're part of the curse, by the way. Read Genesis. You know what thorny ground does? Thorny ground, if you don't dig it out, chokes every good thing that's trying to grow there. I was just in Michigan preaching last week, and uh, they got a big soybean crop right now, and I saw all those farmers. I'm talking about acres and acres and acres and acres of soybeans, and I saw them out there with their hoes. What are you doing? Got to get all this junk out of here. Going to kill the crop. Don't keep us from having good fruit. Look, please, what's true in this world is true in your heart. One thorn bush in your life will choke out all the good things God's trying to grow there. By the way, how do you deal with a thorn bush? Do you go out in the garden with a pair of scissors and clip off all the thorns? Let me tell you something. They're coming back. The only way to deal with a thorn bush, I know it's painful, is you got to reach down and grab that thing by the roots and pull it up and get it out of there because if you don't, it's coming back. And some of you think, maybe this thing's not for me. You know, I've heard these messages before and I've tried all this before. I don't know. I don't see much good fruit. Could it be that you're allowing other things to grow in the soil of your heart where only God and God's word ought to be growing? And by the way, whatever you feed is going to grow. And some of you are feeding the wrong things and your thorn bushes are growing. And what started really simple has now become a jungle. You're having a hard time working through and wading through. Look, you're going to have to go in and deal with the thorns because they're going to choke out every other thing. Young man, that lust in your heart is going to choke out every good desire. That pride in your life is going to choke out the glory of God. Oh, yes, it is. That unholy desire in you is going to choke out the holy desires. You're going to have to deal with a thorn bush in your heart. When I was just a teenager. I remember the story of a young man who had a pet boa constrictor. That's not a good pet for the record. I hate snakes. The only good snake is a dead snake, and all God's people said, amen. How many of you like snakes? You're sick human beings. I want you to know that. He had a pet boa constrictor. He had it trained. He could snap his fingers and it would constrict. He would snap his fingers again and it would loosen its hold. It was fascinating. He could put it around somebody's arm. He could snap his fingers. It would start to tighten and then snap his fingers and it would loosen. For safety, they kept it in a, a glass case in the biology department of his school. It was his snake, his pet. One day when the teacher, the professor was out of the room, this young man grabbed this boa constrictor showing off for a bunch of fellow students and wrapped it around his body. Let it wrap itself around his neck. He's just showing off to everybody. Snapped his fingers. The thing starts to constrict. People are screaming and some are clapping. It's quite a show he's putting on. But in the midst of all of it, the young man made a terrible, tragic mistake. 
He gave his hands too close to his body, and the huge tentacle of that boa constrictor came around and grabbed both of those boys' hands and pinned them against his chest. The snake had been trained by him and him alone, and while others tried to pry it off of his body and others tried to snap their fingers and make it loose in its hold, before his friend's eyes, that snake literally squeezed the life right out of that boy. Somebody said, that's awful. Yep. And that's exactly what's happening to some of you. See, you got this little pet thing, this, this sin in your life, and, and you got control of it. You, you control it. You're the master. When you snap your fingers and it does one thing, and you snap your fingers and it does another, you turn it on and you turn it off. But let me tell you something. What started as your servant will soon become your master. And it's not just going to be your master. It's going to be the death of you. It's going to squeeze the life out of you. In the last few days, I've talked to people all over this country. I've been on the phone with people in the last week whose lives are a mess. And do you know where it started? It started as a young man. It started as a young woman with something that they refused to deal with. Hear me now. Sins of a lifetime start in your youth. How old are you right now? Count of three, shout out your age. One, two, three. That's a good age. Wonderful. Happy birthday to you. Add 30 to it right now. Use your fingers, your toes, your phones, whatever you have to. Add 30 to it right now. That quick, that quick, that quick it goes by. On the count of three, shout out your new age. One, two, three. You're old. That's what you are. That's right. You're the old people in the room now. You're the guy with the gray hair. You're the person you think really doesn't understand you and you know because he's so old. Listen to me. That's going to be real soon. Say, so what's the point of that little exercise? I'm not working on your math skills tonight. It's summertime. Who cares about math? Let me tell you what I'm after. Watch, please. What do you want for your life 30 years from tonight? If Jesus tears his coming and lets you live, what kind of man you want to be? What kind of woman? What kind of marriage you want to have? What kind of family you want to have? Excuse me. What do you want your son and daughter to think of you? Today is my son's 13th birthday. And we had a big celebration early all day yesterday and late last night and again this morning before I left. And I'm going to just tell you something. I'm, I'm very happy to be here preaching to you. I'm very happy to be here preaching to you. But if I had to choose between preaching to you and what my son thinks about me, I'm more interested in what Grant thinks about his daddy's Christianity. See, you don't know me. In a few hours, I'll get on a plane and leave here. I won't be anywhere near you, but I'm his daddy for life. And I want that boy to know that his daddy knows God and loves the Lord and is real. I want him to believe that his daddy is a man of integrity. And I want to ask you, not what kind of son or daughter are you, what kind of mom and daddy are you going to be someday? You say, you're talking to us about heavy stuff. That's what a youth congress is. It's time to get serious about some things. It's time to stop living your life for the short term and start looking at the long term. Take the long look on your life. What do you want growing in the soil of your heart 30 years from now? Because you're planting that tonight. And if you want good ground for God, you better deal with the thorns. And then you come to the fourth one. It's the title one. Notice what Jesus says. Look at it, please. Verse number 20. And these are they which are sown on. What's the next two words, please? I want you to do something. In verse 20, I want you to circle good ground, and I want you to draw a line back to verse 8, good ground. He says it not once but twice, like bookends on the story at the start and at the finish. These are they which are sown on good ground. Who are they? Not perfect people. There are no perfect people. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. God's not asking for your promises tonight. He's asking for your heart. Who's the good ground? Look at it. Such as hear the word and receive it. And bring forth fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. Watch, please. It's not about what you produce. It's about what God produces in you. And God can only do it when you receive what God is saying to you. I have no idea, no idea who this is. Somewhere in this room, there's some boy or girl sitting in this seat. You say, man, I'm in the youth congress. Yes, but you're going to hell. 
You're going to die and go to hell because you've never repented of your sin and by faith taken Jesus as your Savior. And you think your daddy and mama are going to get you to heaven or your baptism or your church membership or your friends. I want you to know, when you stand before a holy God, you're going to be sorely disappointed and dismayed. Hear me now. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks of you and it doesn't matter what you say about yourself. It only matters what God knows about you. Are you a Christian? Do you truly know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior? Don't you live your life hardening your heart against the truth and failing to acknowledge what God says is true about you? Let's start here tonight. It's time for some of you to get up out of this seat and say, look, I'm not going to hell for anybody or anything. Some of you are saved. You're saved, but beneath the surface, there's something unsurrendered in your heart. There's, there's a stony ground. That's why they keep getting these little sprouts of fruit, little sprouts of growth, and you do good for a while, and then it withers away, and it gets tough, and you wither away, and the temptation comes, and you wither away because there's something in you that's not been dug out by the Spirit of God and yielded to Jesus Christ. And listen to me, tonight's your night. See, that's going to be painful, yep. Yeah, we didn't come to say who wants to have a good time. We came to say who wants to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. Hey, friend, anybody can sit in a church building, nod their head, listen to the preacher, and say, I love Jesus. Who wants to follow Jesus Christ? Because that's the stony ground has to be dealt with. Some of you have secret sin in your life. Nobody knows. Your thorn bush, not some huge thing everybody knows about. It's what you do in secret. Nobody sees it. It's what you look at on this. It's what you're putting in your eye gate, in your ear gate. It's what's corrupting your mind. You think it's funny? I'm going to tell you something. Someday you're going to weep over the sin you laugh over now. Someday you're going to be broken and somebody else is going to be broken because you let a stinking thorn bush grow in your life and choke the life out of what God was trying to do in you. Kids, look at me tonight. God's got more for you than you ever imagined in your life. He's got big things. He said, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Hey, God's got big plans for your life. But if you let the wrong thing grow in your heart, it's going to choke all that out. You know what scares me? Not what sin brings, what it robs you of. You know, the scariest day is going to be when you stand before God and realize not what you got because of your sin, but what you missed. Whew. Lord, help us. And I'm wondering tonight, which chair are you in? Be real careful now, because what we all want to say is, hey, preacher, I'm over here. I'm wide open. Wait, wait, wait. Let the Holy Spirit tell you that. Because sometimes Pharisees profess to be in this seat, you see. Like, I'm all right. I'm where I need to be. You're telling me there's no thorn bush needs to be dealt with? You're telling me there's no rocks in your soul? You're telling me there's no hardness in your conscience? You're telling me there's nothing between you and God? Nothing between you and God? Wonderful. But I want you to know something. You're not going to be wide open to Jesus' teaching and all the seed he wants to put in you and all the fruit he wants to produce in you if you don't deal with the issues in your own heart. July 27, 1989. What is today? July what? Tomorrow's anniversary. July 27th, 1989, I was 12. And I was in a youth meeting. I was in a youth camp for the first time in my life. And on that Thursday night, God called me to be a preacher. And you say, oh, you said to the Lord, yes, Lord, I'm excited to serve you. No, no, I didn't. I argued with the Holy Spirit. And I learned you can't win that argument, and it's miserable when you try. And finally, I yielded myself to Jesus, and I, I opened my heart to God, and I said, all right, Lord, you deal with all my junk. I got junk in me. You deal with all the junk. Get all that out of me and put in me what you want to put in me. Now, look at me now. I'm a long ways from being what I ought to be, and there's not nearly as much fruit in my life as there ought to be, and I'm personally convicted about that, and I'm praying this for my own life. Lord, make me good ground for God. 
But the week God called me to preach, one of my best buddies got called to preach to. His name was Robbie. Robbie was a tall, distinguished looking young man. He was a fairly new believer. He'd been saved maybe a year or two, but he was on fire for God. Man, he was so excited about serving the Lord. In that same camp, different service, but in that same camp, Robbie surrendered his life to God and said, I believe God wants me to be in the ministry. Everybody was so excited for him. He had a rough background. He had victory. Robbie and I preached our first sermon together on the same Sunday afternoon. First message in a, behind a pulpit. Two teenagers. We served the Lord. We grew up. My dad took a church. We were in a different place, and I went off to Bible college, and I came back. And I said to somebody from that church, hey, how's Robbie doing? And they kind of dropped their head, looked at the ground. They said, you didn't hear. I said, hear what? They said, Robbie's dead. I said, what do you mean he's dead? They said, it's awful, Scott. There's so many good things growing in his life, and he was growing. But beneath the surface, there were some things he held on to. There was a group of old friends that used to get together. And he quit running with them for a while. You know, they'd drink, do drugs, lots of mess. And he gave all that up, followed Jesus. But somewhere, somewhere he let things start growing in his life again like that. And one day, Robbie with a bunch of buddies overdosed. And just like that, Every good thing was choked out. Robbie didn't graduate, never went to Bible college, didn't get married, never had children, and never had the privilege that I have had of standing before a group like this and trying to help a group of young people. And I think about him when I come to meetings like this. Now, I believe he was a Christian. I believe he knew, loved the Lord, got messed up. But I think about him in nights like this. Because I know something. It's not about how you look on the outside. It's not about the show you can put on. That's not it. That's not it. It's about your heart. Don't you think you're above it? Don't you think you're the exception? Let him that thinketh he stand to take heed lest he fall. You're going to have to pick one. I'm sorry. You can't be in more than one chair. You've got to pick one. I didn't ask which one's your youth director think you're in. I didn't ask what are your friends in. I didn't ask which one do you want to be or plan to be someday. I asked where are you tonight? Which seat are you sitting in right now? If the Holy Spirit of God had to reach down from heaven, put his finger on you and say, all right, you're in this seat, which seat would he put you in? Because he knows. And maybe the better question is this. When you leave this room, which seat will you be in? And tomorrow morning, we'll, we'll start having split sessions and we're going to deal with lots of practical things on, on the word of God and prayer and witnessing, lots of things over the next couple of days. Which seat are you going to sit in? It's funny, but I, I'm, I'm in youth meetings so often, certain things I can just, I spot them. I don't know what that was that I just... Like a superhero, things are coming out of my fingers now. That's amazing. I can spot certain things. It's weird. Like I meet the same people all over America. They're different names, but they're the same people. There's the guy, you know, he's just really not interested, and he's there because some girl's there, and, you know, he comes in and just kind of slouches down and crosses his arms. And, and they're the people who've heard it all before. I see them. It's like, phew, another sermon. Oh, Mark 4, we know that story. All right, preacher, entertain us. Come on now. Give us your best shot. Teach us something we never heard before. Try not to let us go to sleep for the next 30 minutes. There's a person that's kind of nominally interested. Well, you know, that sounds good. I really should do that. I'm going to think about that a little bit. I don't think I'm ready for that tonight, but soon I mean you know he's right that's what I want someday 
somewhere in the crowd, there's this person. It's just like hungry, like taking it all in. And by the way, it's not always the person who's been around it all their life. Sometimes it's the person who doesn't even know a whole lot about it. It's all fresh to them. And man, they're soaking it up. And it's just like, give me more. They're hungry for God. You can't explain it. They don't know all the rules. They don't even say it all just right. But there's something in there. You know what that is? It's heart. But here's what I've come to realize. I spot certain things looking across an auditorium. But really what I'm looking at is more fruit. And what God looks at is root. And he sees stuff I can't see. And if you think it's kind of weird that a youth director, like, is starting to figure you out where you are, let me tell you something even weirder. God had you figured out a long time ago. He knows you better than you know you. And remember, the sower is not me, it's Jesus. You know what he's been doing in here tonight? He's been walking up and down the aisles doing this. You say, that's weird. No, but he's been doing it. He's been casting seed all night long. Truth. Truth. Oh, you can live a life you want to, but Jesus casting out truth. And you know what he's looking for? He's looking to see if there's anybody in this room wide open to God, in tune with heaven, have ears to hear, let him hear. Somebody that says, we want everything God has for us. That is good ground for God.